Hello, everyone. This is Deborah Rue, and this is Human Potential at Work. I am the CEO of Rue Global Communications, and we're proud to be market influencers and strategists for the community of people with disabilities and the aging market. Today, I have someone in the field that has been a leader in the field quite a long time, and the work he's doing is fascinating, and I have wanted to have him on the program for a while, but he's like in the Amazon and Ecuador and all over the world, you know, really changing the world. So very, very excited to introduce uh, Dr. Peter Blank today, and uh, I just a few things. I'm going to let him give us an introduction, but I do, I, I, I'm afraid he won't do some of the bragging I'm going to do. So um, he was awarded as a graduate student, the American Psychological Association um, graduate Research Award. It was the Edwin B. Newman Graduate Research Award. So even as a graduate, we knew he was going to change the world. So that is pretty cool. Also in 2005, Syracuse University named him a university professor, which is the highest ranking um, professor that you can be granted. And only eight individuals have been granted that. Um, that particular title um, in the history of the university. And also, NARRTC gave him the Distinguished Service Award for his contributions to people with disabilities. And there's no way in this 30, 45 minutes that we're going to talk that I can tell you all of the contributions he had made, he's made to our community, but he's not done yet. He's still doing a whole bunch of stuff. And so, Peter, welcome to the program. And do you mind just um, telling the audience a little bit about who you are and who you work with? And there's so many different things you're doing. It, it's uh, I'm just in awe of your work. Well, Deborah, it's a, it's a great pleasure to be with you. Your work is so important and reaches around the globe. Thank you for that kind introduction. I'm kind of an odd bird because I, as you said, got my PhD in psychology first and then went on to get a law degree and practice law in the disability field for many years. Why? For personal and professional reasons, many people often come to these areas. And I've really been blessed to work with great mentors and great colleagues. In 2005, as you said, I was invited to come to Syracuse and start a new institute across disability, cross global, uh, cross interdisciplinary effort, which has grown quite a bit. I'll tell you about that. Uh, it became called the Burton Blatt Institute. Uh, Burton Blatt, as you probably know, was a beloved figure in the disability rights advocacy movement. In the 1970s, he was going into institutions with a camera on his belt, doing uh, a famous expose, photographic expose called Christmas in Purgatory. And it showed the horrific conditions of people living in our country at that time with severe disabilities. And, and in many ways, it lit the fires of reform to, to uh, change this field. So when I was invited by the university and his family to organize this institute, uh, we received gracious funding from the family and support uh, today after about 65 million plus dollars in projects and offices in New York City, Syracuse, Atlanta, Washington, Lexington, Kentucky, growing in Los Angeles. Um, we try to do leading edge work that has a real impact for the community. And um, I guess you could call us a think tank in action. We're a niche player. We have fantastic PhDs in uh, economics, sociology, rehabilitation, medicine, MDs. And of course, for most of us, either we have a relationship with a family member with a disability or people with disabilities themselves. And we work on an array of projects in the areas of employment, financial literacy, technology, and the future of privacy and security and independent living for people with disabilities, ranging from smart homes to smart cities to autonomous vehicles and artificial intelligence. Yeah. Um, a new line of work that we're working on now to us is extremely important, and I think to the world as well. As your viewers probably know, uh, there is a UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, and in that convention, it's Article 12, there's a very important focus on legal representation, legal recognition before the law. And uh, that's tied, of course, to autonomy, independence, self-determination, much of which has been not 
thought of as deeply as it should have been in the past years for many people with disabilities. So we have many large international studies and randomized trials, interestingly, the first of their kind, that are looking at the efficacy or the importance of this concept now of supported decision-making, which is essentially a technique or a, a strategy which helps people move away from traditional notions of make, others making decisions for them, other decision-making like under guardianship, and allowing them to the maximum extent possible to make decisions for themselves like you and I and everybody does every day. If, right. if my car is not working, my auto mechanic is my support on that issue or my accountant or my physician and so forth. And this sense of support, this natural sense of support that we all take for granted is something that can be thought of in the disability community in ways that it hasn't been thought of before. Why? Because about 99% of people with intellectual or developmental disabilities or more um, have guardians that, good or bad, often direct their lives. And sometimes, even though it may be in their best interests, um, it may not reflect their will and preference. So about four or five years ago, I got a call from a fantastic local attorney who was representing a woman in a small town in Virginia, in Hampton Roads. Her name was Jenny Hatch. And um, this was not a fight between Jenny and her parents, neither good nor bad. This was Jenny's wishes. Her parents had a different view. Uh, Jenny was under the guardianship of her parents. And to her, it was rather restrictive. Uh, before this guardianship, she had worked where she wanted. She had uh, had her own cell phone and had friends she enjoyed. She's a woman who was about 20 near, 29 years old with intellectual and developmental disabilities and Down syndrome. And so for one reason or another, uh, her parents decided they wanted a more restrictive guardianship in place. And essentially, Jenny wanted no part of it. And Jenny uh, went to court. She hired me and Jonathan Martinez, who's an amazing lawyer who was the lead counsel. I served as an expert to try to educate the court about this new idea of supported decision making at the time. And long story short, after a trial and extensive testimony, uh, for the first time in the United States, the court ordered that Jenny indeed was capable of making decisions herself within reason and that it was not necessary for others to decide where she would live, where she would work, who she would interact with and so forth. And that case, as is so often the, the case, kind of became a, a cause celeb. Jenny, to her credit, was uh, written up in the Washington Post, in People magazine. And uh, as a result of that, as stars sometimes align. The federal government approached us and our partners, led by a group called Quality Trust in Washington, D.C., which is a fantastic advocacy organization, and said, what do you think about us funding a national resource center for supported decision making? And that came to pass. It's all free and available. If you Google that, you'll find that. And it's information for parents and providers and families in a way that allows individuals to choose for themselves what is the best course they may want to take. As right. a result of that, um, we were asked by the government, we wrote a grant and we're very fortunate to be funded, to run the first what are called randomized control trials, which is kind of a medical testing of supported decision making, which has never been done before. And we are, we are doing that. And as a result of that, I won't go on too long, we have been engaged in Europe, in Spain, to look at these issues as Europe transitions from guardianship laws. We've been asked by a leading, leading institute in the United States, a woman named Ellen Sachs. I don't know if you know that name. I don't. I don't, but I'll look her up. Ellen would be great for your show. Okay, uh, great. She is a distinguished professor at uh, University of Southern California Law School. She has won a MacArthur Genius Award and has received wow. millions dollars uh, to study the issues she in, she's interested in. She's wrote a book, she wrote a book called The Center Cannot Hold, which was a bestseller, and it was about her life as a woman with schizophrenia navigating the world and the excellence she has created. And so Ellen, to her credit, is now funding us to be her partner 
to look at supported decision-making issues in regard to people with serious and persistent <clears throat> mental health issues, schizophrenia, bipolar disorder. And this is very important because there are terrifically large numbers of people in poverty with intellectual and developmental disabilities under guardianship or with serious and persistent mental health issues who really don't have a voice in their lives. Of course, our hypothesis is voice in life leads to greater self-determination, leads to better opportunities for employment, better quality of life, better social networks, and so forth. It's now, just better for society. Across the board, it's better for society. Better for society. Now, this at Burton Blatt, we have kind of areas of focus which change over time, which are all interrelated. So self-determination, of course, is fantastic, and we're studying it, but if society is not physically and technologically accessible, then it's difficult. Any of us can be as self-determined as possible, but if we can't operate our phones, or if we can't enter buildings, or if we can't use autonomous vehicles, or if we don't have access to livable cities as we age with disabilities in place, it makes our life much more difficult. So with our European partners, and here in the United States, no rest for the wicked, as you mentioned earlier. I'm, I'm president of a nonprofit organization called the Global Universal Design Commission, GUDC. You can look up the website. And it's a group of advocates like myself, some presidential appointees, leading architects, leading technology experts that are looking at ways to develop models, not standards like minimum standards that not not saying negative about them, like the ADA, the accessibility guidelines, those are necessary. Right. But this is about innovation, working with large companies and governments to think out of the box to understand why universal design and more innovative approaches to accessibility are good for communities, are good for business, are good for people themselves. So as you mentioned, I just returned from Ecuador and had the great honor of meeting with uh, Ecuador President Lenin Moreno, um, who I've known for many years. I knew him when he was vice president. He's a leader in the disability movement worldwide. And his ambassador, Luis Gallegos, who you may yes, know. Yes, I do um, know him. Love him. The United Nations is also a leader in this area. Why is Lenin such a leader in this area? Well, he has, of course, a passion for this. Years ago, he was accidentally shot by some sort of robbery attempt, and as a result, used a wheelchair and, and uses a wheelchair today. As a matter of fact, I believe, to my knowledge, I'm not aware of any leader of a country that has a visible disability, certainly not as severe as him. Yeah, I know that there is a woman that um, we, I have another show, Access Chat. Um, there's a leader in, I mean, I forget which country it is, but it's in Latin America and she's in a wheelchair as well. And brilliant, brilliant. And I will, um, we'll make sure that we put her information down for the viewers um, with the show because I'm not remembering her name, but she's a newly elected official about a year ago. So Excellent. And I would recommend to you and your viewers, Luis Gallegos, Lenin Moreno, oh. happy to make yes. those introductions. Yes. So I, I, we've been working in Ecuador for a number of years, beginning with the new airport to yes. really try to make it universally designed. Why? Well, I've had the great fortune to go to the Galapagos and the Amazon, as you said, uh, even though we loved it as a vacation. I was there looking at issues of accessible tourism. Galapagos right. and Amazon are amazing places. And in fact, there are tour services, for example, Ecuador for All, who we met up with that just work to make these sites, these world heritage sites, accessible to people with disabilities. Right. But and also, to people that are aging, right? That are exactly. acquiring disabilities, but have the money to travel. So it's really good for the countries when, you know, the heritage sites are fully accessible to all of us. Exactly. And as you know, and your readers know, my friends who use wheelchairs often say, if I can't go to the Galapagos, they don't use, just lose my money. They're losing my four family members. That's right. Well, that's right. I was, I was down there for a business mission. And the country understands that, given that oil prices are down, that this is a major opportunity for the country. As part of that visit, I had the great pleasure to open 
uh, cut the ribbon and present a plaque for the first universally designed building in Ecuador, uh, which we helped develop. And it was uh, the new convention center at the old airport site, ironically. And this new convention center is not only physically accessible, but technologically accessible as well. For example, they understand, like we do, and many people around the world, that what's the point of having an accessible building if your website doesn't allow people to preview it, people who are right. blind or people who are hearing impaired. So these are all part of the universe of BBI activities. And really the ultimate goal is to advance the social, economic, and civic participation of people with disabilities. The business case component is extremely important to that. And we have done a number of studies which are all available and free on our website, ranging from companies like Microsoft, Procter & Gamble, Sears, Roebuck, who have worked with us to show that they get it. They understand that why would they exclude tens of thousands of people uh, with disabilities from their marketplace? So here in Syracuse, one of our uh, initial and very uh, gracious funders uh, is a gentleman who owns 40 malls around the northeastern coast. And uh, his mall in Syracuse, for example, is called Destiny, Destiny, New York. And it's probably the 18th or 17th largest grossing mall in the country. And he immediately said, well, you know, I want to do the right thing, but why, it gets 30,000 people a day into that mall. Why would I exclude another 10,000 whose right. dollars are as green as John Lancaster used to say as anybody else's? Now, looking forward, of course, there are terrific opportunities in this area, as you and your viewers know. One area which we have been looking at very carefully is autonomous vehicles, and I'm happy to talk about that. In some sense, the vehicle portion of that term is secondary. We're talking about autonomous living, living rooms, workplaces, how that works for people with intellectual and cognitive disabilities or people with dementia or people who are older. What does plain language mean? What does usability mean? Except that you're going to be in something that moves you around, which could be your living room or your office or a meeting room or a conference room. Right. We're trying to understand how disability really is a natural element of the diversity discussion that includes race, gender. But we do that, like you, probably in, in, in a way that focuses on the non-monolithic nature of disability, that we're all intersectional. The experience of an African-American woman who uses a wheelchair is very different than a white man who uses a wheelchair, even at that level. Right, we also right. Do it, what we call fluidity, which is just a fancy word, not so fancy, that we look at it as a life course issue. That is, disability, as you know, is often a function not only of certain human conditions, but motivation, emotion, context, social group. So we really try to understand this human difference, like there are so many other human differences, in the context from which it grows. And uh, the technology companies, for example, I do believe are, are getting it. Uh, years ago, we were fighting the battles of whether the website had to be accessible to people with disabilities, people who were blind. I was co-counsel in a case with a very fine organization and great attorneys, Larry Paradis, who you may know, who sadly passed away, uh, representing the National Federation of the Blind. And we made that happen. Now, the ADA, for the most part, there are some caveats, understands and recognizes that people with disabilities must have equal access to the internet. Right, Next. but but before you continue, um, but we still are seeing 10,000, We I recently read there were 10,000 lawsuits because websites are still inaccessible and websites are being updated and not being made accessible and they're losing accessibility. So, Unfortunately, we still have a long way to go with these things. And I also want to address some of the other that's things. That's absolutely you, that, right, yes. Yeah, my, um, I have a daughter that's 31 years old with Down syndrome, and I chose not to take guardianship away from her because she knows what she wants. And sometimes she, her, what she wants, I don't always agree, is the right 
direction for her. Uh, for, and I'll give you an, a grounded example. She wants to be uh, in employment. She wants to be a famous rock star. Mm -hmm. So it, it's not necessarily in the stars for her with that. And so, uh, you know, but uh, I find that instead of taking her rights away from her, I try to help her understand, you know, what is viable. I, I, so I haven't, I have chosen not to take her guardianship away from her. And I don't think I should, but I also want to point but out. Let, let me just comment on that because that's an excellent point. Supported decision-making is an alternative right. to plenary guardianship, which means the other makes total decisions. You are already practicing supported decision-making. Right. And there are many types of relationships, including guardianship, for example, partial guardianship, which are already doing supported decision-making, advanced directives, uh, powers of attorney, right. all these sorts of things are elements of supported decision-making. So we're not as hung up on the form of guardianship or not. Right. We're more focused on the fact that there's room within this system, which you're doing already, perhaps to allow greater will and preference of the individual. Yes, I, hope that, I hope that's consistent with what you're saying. It, I, it is consistent. And, and I also want to do, I, I want to tell my audience that um, I have interviewed your, one of your colleagues, Dr. Michael Morris, where yeah. we talked about the work that you're doing it, with financial independence. So I'd like yeah. to encourage my viewers to go back to that episode. And once again, we'll put it out on the site. But um, so it, 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 the work that you're doing is really really empowering people all over the world. But also, I, I wanted to comment on some of the things you were saying about universal design. Mm -hmm. When we make something universally designed, it benefits everyone, not just people with disabilities. It benefits all of us, which is why this is so so powerful and why it's so important in the work you are doing with some of these gigantic brands because a lot of people don't feel that uh, corporate brands really care about the inclusion of people with disabilities. And I don't think that's true. I, I think sometimes they don't understand the community comes at these brands with different messages and messagings that sometimes confuse the brands. And so mm -hmm. that's why I like the work that you're doing at Syracuse University and you know, the BBI efforts and even the efforts you're making with uh, Dr. Uh, Michael Morris with the NID, National yes. Institute on Disability. So it, I think that's very, very powerful. But I also want to ask you a question. And so I don't have a PhD. I don't have a master's degree. And okay. so I think sometimes people get nervous when only PhDs are in the room, um, you know, making these decisions. And I I don't think that's really the case because you said you also have a lot of self-advocates and others. Um, how do you make sure that all of the voices, including the voices that maybe don't have degrees, are included in these very powerful conversations? Well, that's, that's really an excellent question. And that's part of our commitment, as you say. I'm going to put a plug for our newest employee, uh, a guy named Jason Harris. Uh, okay. And you can look him up. He runs a thing called Jason's Connection, which okay. has about 200,000 followers or however that's counted. Right. Jason yes. is a young man with autism. And he is an extraordinary speaker and writer, recently graduated, and is part of our, it's not even a commitment, part of who we are to have as partners and colleagues people like Jason who enrich us and help us understand the perspective of the world from, from so many different perspectives. Right. For example, the financial literacy uh, work you mentioned before, um, from a business perspective, it's no surprise that among our biggest supporters of that are the banks. The banks want to encourage and compete for customers and their families. But uh, we have a whole team of individuals across the spectrum of disability who work with us to understand what does it mean to save money? Why do you want a credit card? Um, how do you put away retirement money? How do you open a checking account? So we don't, we try not to lose sight of the practical effects of what we're doing. We are very, we are kind of entrepreneurial academics in that sense. We are an applied think tank. 
Now, the reason why we do the basic research, for example, we've just gotten a large grant to study this new ABLE Act, which is right. the savings program for people with disabilities tax-free. Now, the reason why we study that end is because increasingly evidence-based policy drives the dialogue in our government. In other words, what is the basis in evidence for these things? Of course, you want anecdotal information as well. Jason, Jenny, and others telling their stories. Right. But we, we try to take that research and apply it in very meaningful ways. And alternatively, that research is only derived from those experiences of individuals like the Jenny Hatch case led to this whole line of study. And that's kind of been the blessing and typical in the areas that I work in. And I know that before we went on camera, we were talking a little bit about the work because I'd gotten involved in some conversations that um, Michael Morris and you were having about artificial intelligence and, yeah. and will artificial intelligence. I just saw a 60 Minutes episode where the man said that artificial intelligence is going to take away 40 percent of our jobs. I wish that he had continued that thought because what we know is but there are a lot of jobs that all of this efforts are doing that are bringing bringing new jobs. For example, social media jobs didn't exa exist 15 years ago. Exactly. So there's there's all these new jobs that are going to be created. And if we do it in the right way, it's going to enrich all of our lives. And so I know you are very involved with that. And you had mentioned, um, you'd mentioned the one where they were wearing the cameras to oh, yes. figure out the mobile. I, I was wondering if you wouldn't mind talking a little bit about that because I love the technology potential. But I think humanity is rising and that technology, artificial intelligence, IoT, robotics, all that can actually improve all of our lives and make us all a little bit more um, capable of really diving into what the abilities that we have. Yeah, well, that's another excellent question. You can serve up questions all day. Uh, so, so my book, Equality, E, quality, little e, capital Q, talks about a lot of these issues, and I'm delighted to talk about that with your readers or reference that. But essentially, as you know, there are more sensors on this planet today than people. Yes. So that means putting aside the privacy and security issues for a moment, which, which is another topic which we have talked about and written about, there's a terrific potential for what's called livable cities, right. smart homes, smart vehicles, and of course, the challenge will be to integrate those in a seamless way. The so-called Internet of Things, IoT, your coffee maker, your thermostat, and so forth. And again, putting aside very important issues of privacy and security. Right, right. We're still figuring those out. <laughs> yeah. I mean, we are very interested in understanding, obviously, the implications of that. Search capability combined with artificial intelligence which is essentially Watson and all these movements, the IBM Watson, in relation to people with disabilities, but more importantly, to all of us, whether we right. become disabled in the future, whether we have a child with a disability, whether we're aging and so forth. And, and the challenge there will be first to understand what we mean by content. So for example, websites might be accessible with screen reader technology or caption for people who are blind and deaf, but they may be totally understandable to many people with intellectual or developmental disabilities who can otherwise understand them if they're presented in different ways. Right. So a couple of projects. Let me start with another no rest for the wicked. I also am president. That's it. Of, a, of an organization called Raising the Floor USA. Right. Oh, I love what they're doing at Raising the Floor. Raising the Floor is headed by Greg Vander Heiden and a European and international group. I'm head of the US operations. But Greg was very fortunate and the team to get a very large grant to develop what is now called Morphic. That's the new name. Okay. And essentially, Morphic is the capability for you and I or anybody to pick up any device we want or to go to any place we want, like a library, many people with disabilities can't afford the, the fancy smart thousand dollar smartphones and go to libraries for job resumes and so forth. 
And because you will have put your preferences in the cloud, securely and privately, which is another area as well, right. that device will automatically configure to your preferences anywhere, anytime. Large print, not yet plain language, uh, different contrast, captioning, and so forth. Now, Apple, of course, and other companies are on this bad wagon. You have the accessibility features in Apple. Right. Apple, of course, is amazing, but it's a closed system. We are totally open source, and we're also a marketplace for apps. So the idea is to create systems and opportunities that can be used to enable people with disabilities to as freely as possible uh, engage in the digital environment. Now, in regard to the relationship between the digital environment and the physical environment, livable cities, of course, there's a terrific amount of work to do there. There are a lot of issues with historic properties in Europe and elsewhere. Put those aside for a moment. There's a very distinguished professor named Anna Lawson, who you may know. Yes, I do. at Leeds University. Stellar, stellar researcher. She happens mm -hmm. to be blind. I am delighted and honored to partner with her on a grant where, for example, we are just now focusing on sidewalk travel. You have to start somewhere. You know, and that's a good one. That's a really apparently. good one. Yeah. So we are going to ask people, volunteers, to put on their heads, GoPros, and follow them during the day. To oh, look at cool. the types of barriers, the types of challenges, and obviously to build a dictionary and best models of what's going on in that world. Of course, the, the huge rollout of this is to integrate that with city platforms so that everything is understandable from an accessibility point of view. It may not be the case that every element of every city will be accessible, but it certainly can be the case that there are maps and opportunities for as full and equal access as possible through projects like this. So, Peter, I, I love that. Sometimes I, I sometimes I'll go to a conference, um, and the conference buildings are so huge, and I can't get around. And I wonder how my colleagues that are blind, uh, you know, you know, are getting around. And so, all this work, and and one thing that I love about the work that you're doing is that. Sometimes people think nothing's happening, but there is actually quite a bit that's happening. People just don't know about it, which is one reason why I do this show. But many people my age, I'm one of the baby boomers, and um, we want to age in place. We don't want... We, we, we realize the way we've been taking care of our elderly is wrong. We need to do a much better job. But I love that, and all of the baby boomers, and there's, you know, it, the numbers are interesting because some people say 80 million, some say 72 million, and that's just here in the U.S., and keep in mind, um, there are baby boomers all over the world, so the numbers are huge. They want to age in place, and so all of these efforts that you're making, how to, and, and to finish the one thought I, I didn't put out is that they're all now, this year in 2019, 55 years or older. Yes. And so j just to, you know, put that pin in there, but how are all these efforts that you're doing helping people that want to age in place and benefiting the rest of society, but also those people that are now over the age of 55? Yes. Well, that's an excellent question. And we, what we will see in the future, likely, again, putting aside the George Orwell 1984 and security and privacy, which are not insignificant issue. Right, right. But we will see in our lifetime probably a greater association between our physiology and sensors and livable places. And we have that already. My mother-in-law, who's 90 years old, uh, I believe calls a telephone number and adjusts her pacemaker as a result oh. of that tone. That's so cool. That's so cool. As assuming uh, bodily integrity, security, privacy, which is an important thing, Right. We will see homes that are adapting as the physiology of biomaterials change. For example, a woman or a man who's older, uh, who is an older adult, may be wearing a sweater that's beautiful and perfectly designed, but that sweater may be taking heart rate, right. blood pressure, and God forbid, 
if something happens and there's some blood or something, that sweater may administer antibiotics, may call 911 and so forth. This is not so far off. As a matter of fact, right. um, you know, always, always in the mix, the military, of course, right. Right. is looking at the interface of biomaterials and soldiers' health. So God forbid, again, if a soldier gets injured, the medic is the clothing. The medic administers the medicine, whatever it may be, and connects with the telemedicine group to do what it can to save the soldier's life. We will see the same thing, of course, in all sorts of environments that will allow older adults, like you're saying, to live more independently, hopefully freely, Not we're not talking big brother, right. but the future challenge is how we come to grips with this technology in ways that integrates with our physiology. And if we do that well, it can be a much more independent uh, world in, along the lines you're talking about. Of course, if that's abused, then there are a whole host right. of other sorts of problems that arise. And, and you know what? The reality is there will be some abuse. That's just part of being human. But I think more good will come of it. And my husband is, um, my husband's older than me. And um, we've been married a long time, 37 years. I was calculating that last night. And he, a few years ago, was died. married at 12 years old. Or oh, something. thank you. Thank you, Peter. I love you. <laughs> and as my sister said, why are you letting your hair grow gray? I was like, I'm not letting it. It's already gray. But um my husband has been diagnosed a couple of years ago. My husband was diagnosed with early onset dementia and it, it did terrify me. And it's, it's been very interesting walking this path with my husband. Um, what's interesting to me is I have to slow down and pay attention more instead of running a billion miles an hour like I do. But what my husband has lost, he has lost processing abilities. He's lost some communications. But what makes my husband the unique, smart aleck, fun individual that he always was is still there. My husband, Edward, is still there, but I have to go in different ways. And so all of this stuff that's happening are going to really support people like my husband because the rates for dementia and Alzheimer's, especially in this population of baby boomers, the numbers are very scary and very yeah. frightening. And sometimes when I, I remember when I used to tell people my daughter had Down syndrome, they would be like, oh, and I would think, but, but wait a minute. No, that's not a, uh, that's not a tragedy. She's really fun. She's very innovative, very interesting, blah, blah, blah. Now they're saying that when I say it about my husband, and it is, there are some sad components. Of course there are. But at the same time, it, it is making me evolve as a human being. It's making him evolve. And I, it's it's not a tragedy, but it's making us live our lives differently. And all this stuff you're doing, Peter, this is going to help families like mine. I hope so. I hope that in our lifetime, we will see this technology deployed successfully so that you and I wear glasses. I don't know if Edward wears glasses. He does. We may have a so-called Google Glass which is a supportive nudge that says, don't you think you want to call your wife or isn't it time to take your medicine? Again, we'll be very careful about Big Brother and of course right, not right. overdoing that, but there certainly will be vehicles by which we'll understand that Edward perhaps is a little confused right. or perhaps, you know, I thought you were going to the office of the dentist, but now you're headed here. Do you think you want to change your path? Right. Um, right. You will see that. In yes, and, I'll, and that and, will be and, integrated into smart cities, smart cars, and so forth. I'm excited about the future. And I know that we're out of time, but I'll just give you an example. My, my husband's father lived until he was 91 years old and he refused to go into assisted living. I I remember begging him and he's like, nope, I, he was a medical doctor and he used to work in those facilities. He's like, absolutely not. Yeah. And my mother went in one and then she was like, absolutely not. And she got out. But it, it, there's so much happening. But I remember my my father-in-law, um, he went to his doctor's appointment at one o'clock Unfortunately, he went at one o'clock in the morning instead of one o'clock in the afternoon. And um, just to prove the point that you're saying, but 
I want to make sure that the audience knows how to find your work. So uh, before we let you go, and hopefully you'll come on again, and because you're changing the world and you have changed the world and you're really doing amazing stuff. And so are all the people you're working with. And we need to support this and we need to know about what's happening, which is why I wanted you on the program. But tell our audience how they can find out more about you. Uh, I'm, I'm telling you, you can do a real quick Google search sure, and sure. find his Wikipedia page and all the stuff, but to tell them how they... Well, I should say first that my view has always been like yours. We do well when everybody around us does well, when right. Edward does well, when Jenny does well, with all the people we're working with. So this is really a, a group effort. Uh, the Burton Blatt Institute is, is at http colon slash slash bbi.syr.edu. All of our materials are available free. If there are books or other materials your viewers would like, we're delighted to work with you. We work with individuals to the largest corporations in the world. And of course, we're a nonprofit. And our goal, like yours, is to make a world, the world a little better place for the next generation. Yes, and it, it's really powerful work. Powerful, powerful work. So we'll make sure that we give you their social media handles and we'll put all of that stuff out on uh, the website so that you can find it. But thank you for your work. Thank you, Peter. I, I, I thank you. My family thanks you. I know our audience is appreciative of what you're doing. And um, it's very exciting what we can do together to make the, you know, make us all, all of our lives better. So thank you so much for being on the show today. We really thank, appreciate you. Thank you very much. It's been a great pleasure to talk with you. Yes. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye.